All right, I'll, I'll text him and try and get him in here. Okay, welcome everybody to the uh, weekly roundtable. Uh, every Sunday night we get together. Uh, we, we actually have a name for ourselves now. We're, uh, we're going to call ourselves Firefighting Today. I've actually registered that name, so we've got, a, we've got a name and a place. We've got a website, firefightingtoday.com. So you can find all the past episodes there and uh, see what you want to do. And tonight we're going to talk about tips and tricks. We're going to pass a little bit of experience out. We've got a uh, smaller panel tonight. We might have a couple of folks joining us a little later. We are, of course, you know, this, today is a major day. It is February 2nd, 2014. And as you all know, some people are distracted by the fact that it's Groundhog Day. No, no, it's Super Bowl Sunday. That's what it was. I knew it was one of those. I knew it was something like that. I actually saw my own shadow this morning, and that's probably six more weeks of misery for somebody. But uh, anyway, let's get started. So uh, my name is Pete Lamb. I do PeteLamb.com, and I do the Firefighter Training Podcast. Uh, that's what I'm about. i uh, been in the fire service quite a while, just recently retired. So we'll just run the panel uh, quickly. John. All right, let me unmute myself there. Uh, John Fisher, Battalion Chief of San Diego Fire Rescue. Excellent. Glad to have you with us tonight, John. And we know we could lose you on a moment's notice. I know that, so we'll take that risk. Joe, tell us where you are, who you are and where you're coming from. Uh, Joe Starnes. I'm the son of Craig Ashcraft Starnes. Uh, I'm retired fire chief <laughs> from, uh, from Monroe, North Carolina. I'm a public information officer for... Oak Grove Volunteer Fire Department and hang around with a group of guys from Project Kill the Flashover. Excellent, excellent, good stuff. And Ethan? Ethan Dan Seth, Green, Ohio. All right, Ethan is our resident uh, student of the trade, as we call him, and research person and all around, uh, all around technological support guy. If we were running the chain, of, if we were running incident command, I'd have to throw uh, Ethan in logistics. That would be his role, I'm thinking. So, uh, so we said tips and tricks tonight. Now, there's a whole bunch of stuff running around the fire service. Uh, it's everywhere, and if we've got any listeners uh, out on YouTube, if you want to. Uh, chime in, give us a comment, uh, whatever it is you want to do, uh, leave a YouTube comment and you'll be able to, uh, to get right to us. We can bring that comment in uh, and, and be able to, to do that. Also, if you're out there, if you're tweeting, if you use the hashtag FF Roundtable for Firefighter Roundtable, FF Roundtable, uh, we'll be able to see those comments as well. So my idea for tips and tricks, I mean, this, there's been a hundred articles written in the magazines about, you know, what do you carry in your pocket? You know, we could even go to that level of what do you carry in your pocket? But there's all kinds of tips and tricks. And I thought we'd start a discussion. Uh, Ethan shared with me briefly that, uh, you know, he's actually got some photos we can talk about. So, uh, you know, tips and tricks. So here's one. Um, I, this was relayed to me by a senior firefighter that was uh, that I knew for a long time. He was a chief officer, uh, and he ran this by me when I became a chief officer. And he said uh, he stole this from an old New York fire guy. So, so this is about fifteenth hand that you're getting this, but it's an interesting tip. The uh, the New York guy used to stand out in the street and he put his foot somewhere near the first hose line that was pulled. And, he, and he'd always kind of try to make contact with that hose line, just having his foot on it. And so this guy runs into him, and he said, well, what's the point of that? And he said, if that line's moving, everything's going okay. If that line's not moving, then something's going wrong. Something ain't quite right. And that's kind of interesting. I thought that was an interesting tip. You know, if the line is moving, the crew is not encountering excessive heat. They're, they're getting done what they need to get done. And uh, so that's the kind of thing we're going to talk about tonight. Any, any thoughts on that about, uh, you know, John, you're a battalion chief. Joe, you're a retired chief. Uh, what, what about paying attention to that line and making sure it's moving? I think it's a great idea. Um, the only problem is, is it's not too often that my Suburban is parked on top of the line. <laughs> and, if, and if it is, we're in trouble. 
Yeah, yeah. No, it, it obviously puts you real close to the scene. It's not the best operating position, certainly, but uh, it, it is a, it is an interesting tip, and it does, you know, it's how you kind of read those things, and that's a that's an old, experienced officer that was uh, sharing his wisdom. Uh, Ethan, why don't you throw up the first picture? We'll do these one at a time. Throw up the first picture, and uh, let's see what we got. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I just I just had trouble screen sharing myself. All right, I'm clicking it and it's not going. Yeah, it might be might be something to do with the uh, hangout on air. But uh, so describe the first picture. <laughs> Let's see how good you are. Describe the first picture. All right, um, the first one is simply using the Halgen as a step uh, to get in the first floor window. Um, useful for VEIS of a first floor room. Um, that's the one major thing I found it useful for. Yeah, no, I think uh, I think that's awesome. Uh, where else? I've seen that used, you know, using your Halligan as a, uh, as a step. Where else, uh, John? I'm sure you've seen it. Joe, you've seen it. Where else can we use a Halligan uh, as, a, as a brace or a support? Well, it's used a lot in the um, ventilation, vertical ventilation, when you're on the roof. It's used for a uh, place to lock your foot, you know. Or that's one obvious place. Yeah, uh, good, good point. You just drive the uh, drive the pick right in and stand on the ads, if you will, the ads end. It's, uh, it gives you a little bit of support. Uh, John, anything else on that one? Yeah, riffing off of that, I, I got to, I'm kind of, going back and forth making sure my microphone's muted or not but uh riffing off of that um pretty handy to uh to get up on a parapet wall or something like that parapet wall is a good one the other one is if uh if you're in an um if you happen to be in an elevator and you need to extricate yourself from that elevator and get up to uh get up to the hatch or what have you it's not a bad uh I'm getting uh, I'm getting some pretty good feedback from somebody. I don't know, but yeah, uh, stepping on that tool in the corner and uh, and getting it done. Oh, there you go, Ethan. There you go. Also, to get out of the basement to the basement window. Yeah, one of the things I'm not fond about with that is you got to remember to lean back out the window and grab the thing and take it with you unless you have another tool. Right. Yeah, there was a whole school of thought when I was uh, when I was a youngster where people would say, you know, use the tool for this, use the tool for a door chalk. Use no, no, no. Take the tool. You're absolutely right, Chief. Take the tool with you. You never leave your tool behind. So that's uh, that's certainly one you can use there for sure. Absolutely. I've got a few tools on the job I'd like to leave behind, but that's a different story. Yeah, I I was talking about the metallic ones. I would the, oh, the oh. <laughs> I was talking about the steel ones. Um, so that's uh, that's a good one. What else you got, Ethan? I think you've got the roof one there, don't you? you we we talked about that. So if you got that one, yeah, there, there's uh, there's what Joe was talking about uh, using it to step up onto uh, as a support for the roof or what have you. You know, somewhere that's going to start a whole discussion about Joe and rooftop ventilation, and I just, I'm not going to bite for it tonight. He's not going to get me. <laughs> I'm not going to let it happen. Um, oh, I, I, I'm proud of it. It keeps me in business. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. What else you got there, Ethan? Tips and tricks we're talking about tonight. What else you got? Uh, this is using old hose as... Um a container for your tools, put in your uh, pants or coat pocket. All right, so th it, this is a good time to have this discussion. So what they've done is taken an old length of uh, three-inch hose, wrapped it up, beefed it up with duct tape and all that sort of thing, like we, you know, fix it like a fireman, you know, hack it, hack it to bits. Uh, and, and carrying stuff in your pocket. So I, I think that's worth a little bit of a discussion. I'd be curious to hear... Uh, this is a great way to obviously protect internal damage, and it certainly fits in your bunker pants pockets pretty uh, pretty easy. 
Uh, so that's uh, so that's a good thing. But uh, John, what do you think? What what? Well, you carry some different tools now that you're chief, probably. But what what do you think about stuff that should be carried in firefighters' pockets? Well, um, first off, no, actually, I don't carry different stuff uh, now that I'm a chief, other than you know maybe like a magic marker. But uh, when I uh, when I gotta work as a safety officer uh, and, and at times go in the fire, I still want the same stuff in my pockets. Um, we carry a, a very similar um, setup on, on all of our apparatus, actually, uh, and uh, it, it's right on the inventory called the battery pack. Uh, as you might imagine from the name, it's what we use for, um, for batteries at uh, vehicle fires and, and accidents and stuff like that. So um, what, what you're looking at is a picture that, of something that's uh, quite familiar to us. Um, for other stuff in the pocket. I've always been partial to vice grips. Uh, other other folks are uh, partial to channel locks and stuff. I like using those uh, either one, whichever one works for you, uh, for uh, through the lock um, sort of entry, that kind of thing. Um, can't really think anything off the top of my head that hasn't been covered in a million and one different uh, articles in one of the uh, journals that, that I carry. Yeah, I, I like vice grips. I think they're a good tool. It's an overhead door tool. You can use it on a garage door. You can use it for a lot of different things. You put a little uh, little clip on it, hold it away if you're dealing with padlocks and things like that. Uh, a lot of uses for that. And I got to tell you, all the time I was on the job, I always tried to get, you know, a, a pretty decent multi-tool. You know, you can do a lot of stuff with a multi-tool many times. You know, it's not a substitute for full wire cutters or things like that or cable cutters, but uh, certainly certainly worthwhile uh, to, to have a, a decent multi-tool with you. Um, what is the what about wire cutters? I mean, there's this whole debate, uh, Chief or Joe or anybody that Adam Adams with us uh, about cutting yourself out when you're entangled. You know, break, carry cable cutters and wire cutters so when you're entangled, you can cut yourself out. Just uh, what are your thoughts on that, Chief? Uh, you know, we just got a grant from a local uh, organization to buy a, a pair of wire cutters for all of our folks. Uh, so when you buy, uh, I guess when you buy 800 of them or something like that, you can get them for pretty, uh, pretty darn cheap. But um, so obviously we're believers in that. Uh, I think I mentioned in a previous um, discussion that uh, we're going through the IAFF uh, fireground survival right now. Um, so there's, there's a lot of folks getting some experience with that. Um, uh, one, one handy tip there: uh, make sure you cut the wire that's entangling you and not your microphone cord. Uh, as one of our uh, gentlemen uh, did at the class, so uh, yeah, we're we're uh, we're liking that. Yeah, it's uh, you know, there's pros and cons. I, I you know, some people say that uh, you know, I'd I'd be cutting my my uh, my air pack line. That's what I'd be cutting. You know, I'd I'd be a menace to society. But uh, certainly, uh, certainly uh, appreciate the use of cutters. Uh, Adam, what are you carrying out there? Do you carry uh, anything in your pocket? Do your your troops carry anything? Uh, uh I know there was one uh, guy has like a uh, tool that you can actually buy at a hardware store and he kind of made it his own little purpose tool me I carry some webbing and then I got a small like little pocket knife that I've got in my bunker gear I did have uh, wire cutters but I uh, took them out and never put them back in yeah it's uh, it's worthwhile having uh, just say hello to uh, <laughs> Tina Tina is with us FES tidbits is with us in the uh, in the Twitter stream so uh, welcome to you uh, Tina and uh, I'm I'm still getting a bit of an echo, but uh, I think we'll work through it. Ethan, what else you got? You got any other photos? Uh, this year is me and two Halgens together for additional leverage uh, versus seeing one longer Halgen. Okay. Um, good, good, good idea. I don't know how much real leverage you have. I've seen that used uh, uh, in in the textbooks. I have never actually seen it used in real life, but uh, have seen that technique used. Um, I, I would yield to anybody else. Uh, Chief, have you actually used the tools uh, that way with the two uh, forked ends uh, jammed together to give you some additional leverage? Uh, I have not um, in a 
previous life as a mechanic, though, I've tried to uh, extend the leverage on various wrenches and usually find that some part of my body starts bleeding shortly thereafter. Um, I, I could see it working, but, but you're going to end up with a joint in the middle that's going to, you know, unless you really get those things wedged together tightly, you're going to end up with something in the middle that, that moves in a way you don't want it to. Yeah, and it, but that is why they give us helmets. You know what I mean? I've always, they give us helmets, so it's it's got to be safe at some level. It's got to be safe. Um, probably safety glasses in this case. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, Ethan, what else you got for us? I think I got one more here. Uh, this is one I saw today, actually. Um, what they're doing here is they're using two halogens driven into the roof. Uh, to support a roof ladder in a horizontal position. Um, to me, it doesn't really... I don't know. What are your thoughts? Well, it looks like there's another uh, another peak over there somewhere. I don't know if they're trying to traverse this roof. I, I guess just my school of thought would, you know, if I can get to the ridge line, I'd rather be up on the ridge line, straddle the ridge line, it's my opinion, if, if I had my druthers. But... Uh, you know, uh, I I don't know. I'd have to I'd have to get the context, but I'm not I'm not seeing it right at the moment. Uh, Chief, what are you thinking? Is that a technique you're familiar with? Uh, I've never seen it before, but you know, um, I guess in the the recognition prime decision making world, uh, we can count this one as another slide in the slide tray. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure what the use is, but uh, there, there may be some use. Uh, how about our senior member, uh, Joe, any reason to, uh, to, to walk horizontally like that? Well, if you were transversing to get to another roof or it was a pathway, you might have that, especially under slippier conditions. So as, a, as an objective, just to give you a, a, a secure walkway for... You wouldn't have to be over a fire uh, impinging roof, or it wouldn't have to be necessary even a fire. Right. You're just looking for the stability piece of it. Um, yeah, no, I, I can see that. But, uh, again, you know, and it's interesting. It's funny up here. You know, there's still a lot of vertical ventilation going on in New England, and, and I see roof ladders all the time, right? And so let me just state the obvious just for the fun of it is that uh, – you do realize that the roof ladder, when it's hooked on the ridge, is supposed to extend below beyond the bearing wall. Because if not, it's just going to fold in on the deck if something goes wrong. And I just, you see pictures of that all the time. We're kind of, it's a feel good ladder. It's making us feel good, you know. Uh, and it does give you support, obviously, if everything's going well. But if something fails, uh, that's, that's certainly not going to help you out uh, in, in any way. Go ahead. I might, yeah, I, I mean, I agree with you. It should be over the bearing wall, um, but it's still going to help you spread out uh, your weight a little bit. Oh, no question. No question, Chief. It certainly gives you a distribution of weight, and, and we should continue to do it. But, you know, just think about it's like that slide that Ethan was just showing up there is, is you know, we kind of manufacture things sometimes, and 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 do some crazy things you know if you started to talk to manufacturers you know the scba folks now are getting the fact that we're converting you know over the past three four years when we first began to convert scba harnesses you know bring it through the crotch of the legs and use it as a harness the scba manufacturers were out of their mind you know that buckle was designed to break at about 32 pounds that was never designed to do what it was doing so, uh, excuse me. Uh, sorry about that. Um, so, you know, we, we kind of, when we invent these tips and tricks, you know, we need to, uh, we need to use, uh, we, we need to use caution when we do that. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll keep that in mind. So Ethan, you can come back to camera if you want. You can come back on screen if you can undo your screen share. Um, here's another one, uh. Here's another one that we had. Uh, we welcome Lane. Lane is with us. He does not have a camera tonight, so uh, but he's in the chat room, so he can certainly participate and uh, and do that. Um, here's another one that somebody told me, and and it's an interesting one for the folks that don't have basements. Uh, this isn't going to matter. 
but uh, I had a, I had a chief tell me one time that if he suspected a basement fire, uh, he might uh, he might go up and just tap the basement window. Now I'm not talking about indiscriminately. Uh, smashing windows and adding ventilation and doing all that. He might just pop that basement window. In fact, he even said kick it. Um, just to see what is the smoke lazily coming out of there? Is that smoke pushing out of that little, you know, six inch opening you made? See what the status of the conditions are. And that was just a quick and easy tip that he said gave him some sense of exactly what's uh, what's going on. Uh, and, and he also had another one about smoke movement. Uh, we'll, we'll toss that out there uh, as well. Uh, let me just ask Lane. Lane, do you have a mic? I know you don't have a camera, but does your mic work? His, uh, his note off to the right there says no mic tonight. Oh, no mic. No camera or mic. Right, right. I'm sorry. I didn't read the whole thing. Okay, so... Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he'll just have to type in his uh, responses. All right, so he can type fast. So it is it is convenient if the pa any panel member wants to give Lane any crap, you know, he can't talk back to us. So if uh, if we want to do that, we can just feel free and uh, and and go right at it. So uh, let's talk a little bit about you know this is not um, this is not a, a whole smoke reading class, but a little tip or a trick, and I'd I'd throw this out for discussion and comment. If you're looking at a front door, uh, uh, an entryway door, the front door to a house, it's a residential structure, and you see smoke coming out of the top third of that door. You open the door, smoke's coming out of the top third. That's one case. You open a door, different situation, and you see smoke coming out about halfway out the door, but you have clear visibility underneath. And you open the third scenario, and you see smoke from the threshold to the ceiling. Uh, does that give you any indication where the fire could be in that structure, if that's a, a two-story house or, or anything like that? Do, do those descriptions that I gave you give you any idea where the fire might be, what level the fire might be at? Um, anybody want to dive in on that one? How about you, Joe? You must have an opinion on that. I'm not sure I got all of it. I kind of lost you after the first example. If if we have uh, if we have bidirectional flow in a in an orifice, a, a window of our door, um, and we actually have bidirectional flow, then we know that the overpressure is coming out of the top side, and there is an underpressure, and the fire needs that air intake. To support combustion. What we assume a lot is that, and rightfully so, that that compartment is not getting a sufficient air from the other side, what we can't see, and so we assume we can say a general statement like the, the door in the bedroom is closed, or the door in the compartment, or two compartments are closed off and the air is coming from, it needs the air from the window to support combustion. So we can we can assume and and make a symptom case that the the fire is contained into that compartment, whether that compartment's one room or two. That's just one half of that discussion. I don't think that's all you gave us. No, no, that's but we're talking about, and I'll tell you where I was going and see if it makes any sense to you. So, and, and again, this is this is a wild rule of thumb. I'm not talking specifically science here we're talking about fire location if that smoke is coming out of the top third of the door a foot down from the door you might have a suspicion that the fire could be on the floor above it may not be on the floor you're entering that fire could be on the floor above not an absolute but that is not a bad way to think about this if it's about halfway 50 50 in the doorway the fire is probably located on the same level you are at. And, and if the fire is filling the doorway, uh, in, in my case up here in the northeast, uh, we very well could have a fire in the basement uh, that, that's giving us. Now, there are other things. There are a hundred other things that can affect this. But, but just as an observation, uh, pay attention to the way the smoke is filling the opening. You know, the, the best point in life is you wouldn't be seeing it, it would be going out the backside. But do you have any thoughts on that? Anybody uh, have any thoughts on that? Well, well I, don't, I don't think it's something I'd want to hang my hat on. Um, yeah. You know, I, 
Uh, go ahead, Joe. Now go ahead. Oh, I think Joe's cut now too. He's giving it to you, John. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah, I I don't think it's something I'd want to hang my hat on, really. Um, you know, we don't have a whole lot of basements here per se, but we do have a lot of uh, of uh, houses that appear one story from the uh, street. Uh, but a really two-story or three-story that go down in the canyon. So it uh, sounds like Joe's got uh, some kind of dispatch thing going on in the background, judging from the accent. But uh, <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, you know, we, we do see that on occasion. We do have the occasional basement uh, fires here. Um, you know, as far as smoke coming out, I think a lot of that depends on the... On the um, on the uh, structure itself. You know, if we've got a, a place with vaulted ceilings versus eight-foot ceilings, that's going to change things quite a bit, uh, et cetera. Yeah, there's no question. A a again, we're talking about a, a tip or a trick. I certainly would not bet my life on it or the life of my crew, but it is a way to begin formulating your decision. I think, John, you're, you're talking to a guy who's, uh, you know, Chris Norm now is speaking about most of the stuff he's talking about is, is understanding not only the science involved, but understanding the size of the box you're in, the size of the container you're working in is, is huge. Uh, so again, there there are some some thoughts about that, and I certainly I have used that for information in the past. But I agree with you, John. I don't think you bet your life or your crew on it. But you, you certainly have for for an, for an officer with no slides in their tray, uh, that might be something they could take a look at. Um, what else we got? We, we got any other tips or tricks? Things that you found? Things that you saw worked? Things that you maybe saw didn't work? Anybody got anything on the panel? Hey Pete, going back to them basement fires, uh, when I first got on over here in Kellogg, actually there's some of our basements here that you act actually have to go outside and access the cellar doors to go into the basement. Um, I've been on one where the electrical panel had caught fire down in the basement and we actually had a go and open up the cellar doors and as you made your way down the steep steps down at the bottom there was another door to the basement so we um, have those around our community uh, basements like that talking about basement fires yeah I think I think over the course of my career I certainly have changed my theory on uh, fighting basement fires uh, you know we were always taught to go in from the inside and and go to the bottom of the stairs fight your way down there pretty quick it's it you know uh, as I get older, I get a little smarter, and uh, that's not the way you need to be doing it, obviously. Uh, there's, there's, there's other ways to be doing that, but some of the traditional methods brought us from the inside, uh, fighting our way down the chimney, if you will, and uh, really was not a, a, a good place to be in. But yeah, the outside bulkheads are, uh, are, are clearly uh, something else. Um, what else? What else we got for tips and tricks? How do you figure out how many apartments are in the building? Number of mailboxes. Yeah, number of mailboxes, number of electric meters or gas meters or some utility control. Uh, that's not always, not always, again, the absolute, but again, rules of thumb, just tips and tricks. Uh, some things that might get you, uh, get you in the ballpark to figure out what's going on. What else? What else we got? Well, I'll tell you one, you, you mentioned FDNY earlier, and uh, one that uh, I picked up from a buddy of mine who's retired FDNY, I, I distinctly remember as a young firefighter hanging out with these guys and him telling me, no matter what the temperature is, if you can't see your feet, you need to get lower. Um, and that absolutely saved my butt one time in a fire where uh, before the days of two in, two out, uh, I took a line in the back door of what turned out to be a... Uh, an ice house and uh, got in there probably 15 or 20 feet and it wasn't real hot but uh, you know again I couldn't see my feet so I squatted down and found I was on about a two foot wide catwalk with nothing but cooling coils below me so that could have got ugly real fast yeah no that's a great tip uh, great tip you know that's that's in uh, rookie 101 but sometimes even senior firefighters get complacent and just because there's no heat condition, they're in there walking around in, uh, in, in black conditions. You know, we see it here, uh, uh, John. One of the things that we have, and, and I'm sure Adam and uh, Ethan and Joe, for that matter, you know, we get an oil burner backfire up here. 
you know, and you're trying to navigate. There is absolutely no heat to this, but the house is filled with crude black smoke. You know, black oily smoke. And, and so somebody's going to fall down the stairs and break their arm for absolutely no reason because, uh, you know, you can't navigate properly. So that's, uh, that's a good one. That's a good one. Ethan, what else are you reading about? Anything else? Uh, actually, one I picked up yesterday at a, a school seminar. Um, when you go in tight street buildings like your family dollar convenience store, um, they mainly have drop ceilings. Um, and if you're going there on an odor of smoke or smell of something burning, take your hook, your six foot hook, and just pop open that suspended ceiling and see if you have any fire traveling above you um, before you commit your crew 100 feet inside of that building and want to know what's above you. Yeah, no, that's a that's an awesome tip. And I, I actually say that now in some structural situations, but, you know, we go back to, uh, you go back to, uh, you know, the super sofa store fire where you've got fire burning in a concealed space over your head. Uh, poke it up there pretty quick, and I suggest uh, throw that thermal imager up there pretty quick and, and see, you know, if, if you don't have visible fire, do you have a heat signature? Have you got anything going on up there that you need to pay attention to? And you do that very close to the entrance so you've got your back to the door and you can get, get out of Dodge if you need to. So, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great one. Don't be afraid to... Uh, don't be afraid to poke and uh, check something out with a the thermal, certainly, uh, early on. Um, so, what else? How about, uh, how about an old-fashioned one, an old-fashioned hazmat one? Uh, we got something, uh, we'll, we'll actually, uh, we'll actually uh, got something from Lane here. I'll get that to you in just a second. Uh, but there's an old hazmat rule of thumb, and it's still pretty good. Again, it's not something you, uh, you bet the farm on. But if the chemical ends with A-T-E, I-T-E, or I-D-E, eight, it, or I'd, you probably don't want to be using water anywhere near it. Again, you look it up, you do the science, you check five references, you do what you're supposed to do. But just as a rule of thumb, if the chemical name ends in that, you probably want to uh, stay clear of uh, anything involving water with many of those products. Again, you always check. Um, so let's just hear a comment from Lane. Uh, he had a classic smoke read this morning, heavily involved uh, house fire after knockdown, light brown smoke coming from the eaves, absolute confirmation of attic involvement so uh, good read right when you see brown smoke uh, the building is involved uh, it, it's uh, it's it's definitely doing it just a quick one Lane did you pick up on that as the IC from the street or a company officer got it back to you uh, if you can if you can answer that for us and we will just we'll run the little I don't have the jeopardy music if I had that Jeopardy 60-second thing, that would just be awesome, you know? Uh, <laughs> it was sent... The, okay, the... You, you were, the second dude. Yeah, he was the second to BC, the safety officer. Okay, great, great. Uh, and we do that. Any, any tips for the safety officer operating on the scene? Anybody? If you're the safety officer, any tips or tricks that you need to figure out uh, pretty quick? The, you know, the big tip for the safety officer is don't get involved with operations. Do your job as a safety officer. It's really easy for us to start, um, and, and for the folks who work for us, to see a, a you know a fellow with a white hat and start asking questions or what do you want us to do or whatever, and, and uh, that's not the appropriate role for the safety officer. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I got strong feelings. You know, we, we probably should do a roundtable one night on the safety officer because I think with the full panel we could take it places. The safety officer is not the gear police, and the safety officer is not necessarily the accountability officer. Safety officer needs to be, be, be getting a broad, wide picture, in my opinion, my humble opinion, uh, a broad, wide picture. Now, there should be one operational discussion after the safety officer makes some observation initially, gets figures out what's going on, and comes back to the command post. There is a decision. There's one operational question in my mind is, you know, he has an operational question with the chief and says, are we winning or losing? Have we got enough stuff here? 
I mean, is that one discussion, and I believe that's an appropriate discussion, and that's probably the extent of the operational discussion of, hey, you know, this, you know, I just walked around twice. This thing's really ugly. You're, you're not missing. You know, we need to go to an additional alarm or something like that. So the safety officer, I agree, John, does not uh, make operational decisions. True statement. I would, uh, Peter, I would also say is the safety officer of the future will be carrying a tick. Yeah, I absolutely. I, I I agree with you, Joe. I think from a, from an external or an interior berth, wherever the safety officer happens to be uh, be assigned, uh, and and so Lane's making a comment that you know he's commenting that we're right. He actually ended up giving operational orders to some crews, uh, sort of a breach of etiquette, but he did what he had to do at the time. So, uh, and, and I think I think that happens to all of us. I mean, I, I've broken rules that we're talking about tonight. I mean, I've, I've made a lot of mistakes, and that's kind of why we're doing what we do here, so we can share some of those mistakes and, and make sure we don't do it again. Uh, so, uh, so that's that. Uh, also, Sorry? Peter, I put up a, a slide that is actually from one of the tests you might find interesting. He was talking about give it a look with the tick. Uh, if can you see the slide I got on screen share? I am I am not seeing your no. video or a slide. John, are you seeing it? I am not. Joe, if you can go to that, move your mouse on the big screen there and dial down your bandwidth. It's next to the. It's between the video camera and the gear. Just see if you can take your bandwidth down and see if we can get a little more out of you because I am not seeing the slide or your video. I got the bandwidth is wide open. So back it down a little bit and see if we can get something. Um, see if you can save a little bandwidth and, and get that uh, projection. All right. Try Adam, that. are you seeing it? No? No, I'm not getting that either, Pete. No, we're just uh we we're not seeing uh we're not seeing the image, Joe. Uh okay. I was trying to do that a while ago and that's probably why when you were making examples I was trying to put up some of the test examples we had. I mean, uh, keep keep at it, J Joe. Keep keep at it and when you get it, I'm going to see a change in your thumbnail, so uh we'll we'll see that we'll see that work here uh for for sure. Uh, Adam, you've been kind of quiet. What's some of the things that some old firefighter or some chief officer told you or uh, some, some tip or a trick that you might have from a, from a smaller department? Uh, here we've got some nozzles with the uh, pistol grips on them. And uh, I see a lot of our guys grabbing those and holding the pistol grip up against their body. Um, as I train when the new guys are coming in, I train them as hold that nozzle out don't be tucking it in with holding with the pistol grip against your body I make sure they have enough hose line out where they can still get the bail so that way if they have to you know aim that nozzle up they bending with their back they're able to bend that hose and shoot it up if they have to or you know something like that but I do see them grabbing them pistol grips and uh, personally I don't care for the pistol grip yeah, I I don't I can't say I disagree with you, Adam. I'm not a I'm not a pistol grip guy myself. I was always taught to leave about 18, 20 inches out in front of me so you can manipulate that line a little better. Uh, but there is a whole school of thought. We could get into an argument about that. I'll tell you because there are strong, strong opinions uh, ab about that for sure. A um, couple of just a quick comment from Tina uh, watching live, uh, you know, keeping keeping that broad view, you know, she says keep a balance between seeing the forest for the trees or the trees for the forest, uh, certainly, and uh, uh, Tina is always a safety conscious person, always talking about uh, stay alert and stay aware, so we thank you Tina for those, uh, for those tidbits. Uh, so yeah, some some nozzle operations. So get the nozzle a little bit out in front of you is uh, is always a great uh, tip or a trick. Um, yeah, John, were you going to say that. something? Go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I'll build on that a little bit too. I, I find um, maybe it's not a tip or a trick, but I find that when we switch from an offensive to a defensive uh, um, posture and switch to the uh, stack tips, it's very common uh, for folks to be a little bit uh, fired up, if you will, and, and uh, forget to take off the uh, first couple of stack tips. Uh, um, 
So if you're doing that and you only got a one inch tip with a um, two and a half, you're not really doing much better than you were with an inch and three quarter. So I usually have to go around and tap them on the shoulder and tell them to shut it down and take off the tips and bump up to an inch and a quarter or something. Yeah, and you know, that's interesting, John, because we don't really, that's not a skill we train on, right? We don't really, I, I can't ever remember doing a drill where, hey, we're training what, what things need to be done when we go defensive. You don't often train about that, so it's, uh, it's pretty easy to, to, to make that stumble, but you're right. It's, uh, I, actually, <laughs> I actually heard in a major incident uh, one time, it was a mutual aid situation, it was a major incident, uh, and the guy said, uh, the engine, the pump operator, the engineer said, uh, we're, we're starting to go into vacuum. We're, we're starting to go into vacuum. This is a monumental situation that's occurring. And the order was given, well, just put smaller tips on the, on the deck guns. You know, put, reduce the size of the tip. So I guess it's okay to fool the pumper. You're not fooling the fire, but I guess you can fool the pumper, and that might be okay, I guess. <laughs> but it was... yeah, that's, a, um, that's a pretty common um, thing, too, from the rural firefighting world. You know, don't, don't, uh, don't go with a big line because you're going to run out of water too fast. Well, you still have to, you know, it's still GPMs versus BPUs, so... Yeah, yeah, and I can tell you from, uh, for, you know, you look at this gray hair, I've actually run out of building sometimes. You know, I was saving water and I ran out of building, so uh, it's it doesn't uh, always. More than one way to make that fire triangle go away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I've tried a couple of those, so uh, it, it works. Uh, what else we got? Anything else? We usually don't run out of oxygen. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, the sky doesn't catch fire. If this, if that's true, though, John, you know, that's a topic for a whole nother debate. If the sky really doesn't catch fire, why do I always see those ladder, tr ladder trucks protecting that? You know, they're protecting that sky exposure. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, that's, uh, that is a whole nother discussion. Yeah, yeah, we're not going to, we won't go there tonight. We won't go there tonight. Um, what else? So we talked a little bit about hose handling. Uh, what about apparatus driving? Any tips, uh, apparatus drivers? I, I have one that I throw out there to all drivers. I suggest that when you're approaching the scene, you slow that pumper down or that aerial down. Slow it down to a crawl. Look at the house next door. Excuse me. Look at the house next door. Look around. See what you, Pick your spot. See where it's going. You watch YouTube videos, you see it in real life. I've seen it in my own job. Um, you know, people are just screaming up to the scene. Pull C three sides, scream up to the scene, and you, you know, what are you doing? Where are you going? Uh, the truck can't get the right spot because he's got overhead wires. Where if he, you know, picked it a little bit, or if the engine company left him some space, uh, you see this all the time. So one of my tips and tricks is. As you're approaching the street or the scene of arrival, slow that piece down. Uh, I think it's important. Uh, that's that's one from a driving perspective. And obviously, we, we shouldn't have to say it, but I will say it. And that is, uh, you know what? Stop at stop signs. There's a hot tip for you. Uh, stop at stop signs. Uh, that's, that's not a tip or a trick. That's the rule. So... Yeah, I, uh, it's funny, I was just thinking about this last night. We teach people um, not to shift uh, in a turn um, as part of the test, although, you know, of course, we are all automatic now, so I'm going a little bit old school on you. But, um, you know, and the reason for that is, uh, is that one, you want both hands in the wheel when you're turning, but also it's a traction thing, uh, shifting in the turn. You, can, you know, it's a lot easier to lose the rear end that way. Probably not so much here, but, uh, you know, if you're talking back east stuff a little bit, um, you know, but then we just uh, uh, kind of accept out in the field that they're, that they're going to do that anyway. So maybe that's uh, something we need to think about a little bit. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I mean, the, the, some of the, you know, it's, it's funny when you're talking old school about the standard transmission, John, and stuff. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not saying it because it was me, but I, I think it made us better drivers. We were more attentive to driving uh, and, and, and more involved in the actual driving of stuff. I don't know. It, it just seemed to me that there was some, uh, there was some stuff that, uh, that made some sense. Joe, I am seeing a screen share from you. Let me see if I can bring it up on the screen. And there's also a comment from Lane. John, if you wouldn't mind chasing that Lane comment, I'll get Joe up on the sure. screen here. Um, 
All right, so what are we talking? So uh, go ahead, Joe. I've got that slide up there. We can all see that now. I'm about 45 minutes behind, Peter. So uh, <laughs> this, is, this is certainly not, this is not neutral on a five-speed splicer. But uh, um, what you said before, one of the things was to look at it with a thermal imager. Um, what you have here is the same shot one with a CCD camera and one with a thermal imager. And we always ask them, would you put water on the one on the left or the one on the right? Um, and and, the, and they're, the same, they're the, actually the same shot at the same time. Right, right, and so yeah, no, I, I listen. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a believer, uh, Joe, in the in the thermal imager. And I guess the tip, you know, we could give folks is, if if you haven't got enough thermals in your department or on your apparatus, make sure you do. Uh, as I told you folks uh, in an earlier discussion, we had at one point we had 13 person shifts responding. We then got reduced down to nine, uh, and we had nine thermal imaging cameras available for the first alarm. So I'm, I'm, I was a believer. You, you know, the officer had one. Everybody could have one other than the pump operator, really. So uh, uh, I, I agree the need, and I think the technology is, uh, is changing all the time. So, uh, yeah, this is a good discussion. This kind of goes back to my whole doorway discussion, but that's a good way to look at it. Joe, uh, you want to expound on that? Well, w one of the things that happens if you look at this kind of a configuration is is this? It's better to explain these in overpressure and underpressure. When you see full flame coming out of the, the, that compartment and the one on the left, is the air for that fire's combustion is coming from somewhere else. That's the bottom line. And the fact that this is lit off, come outside, it lit off, and come back, this means means it's probably gone through the decay cycle at least one time. Could have went through it several times before it broke that window and made this way outside, or if we broke the window. Uh, the velocity of this makes a difference. If this, if you're talking about the door and whether the fire's on the first floor or in the basement, lazy smoke coming out the bottom of the door is different than high-speed high velocity smoke coming out of the top side of that door case. So there are some differences in, in, in understanding that. For instance, if I've got a window fire presentation, are you seeing a pink and a black screen? We are, yes. yes. If, I, if I look, I drew this simply to say that if you've got a high velocity, what I call extreme fire behavior, if you've got a high velocity and you've got all fire coming out of this pink side over here, and the only place you have is a little round hole where air is going into that, typically when that's a high speed uh, flame and velocity, then that will be the shortest distance to the fire. So it's a path of least resistance. So the actual combustion, the high heat combustion for this window is to the right. That hole will track. Sometimes you'll see the hole in the middle. It usually it means there's two flow paths going back through the fire. So there's a lot of things to your point that you can read by looking at the windows, by looking at the door or the opening. Here you got a window that's full. This is a thermal imager of the front of the building. This is a full flame window coming out. This room's on fire, and, and it's full flame. Here the firemen are going into the door to go down that hallway to turn left to go in that little bedroom, and you see that half of that, wind, half of that door is air. So the major part of the combustion for this room is coming from the door. Now they block that, and things change a little bit. Firefighters actually disturb under pressure flow pass. So there's a ton of stuff to learn from that kind of uh, tips and tricks is my point without Absol getting crazy. No, absolutely, Joe. And I think, again, you, you just kind of made my point for me in, in one regard. So that when you, when you look at this, that fire is located on the same level, the same floor as them. It's, it's an easy way to kind of just make a, a, a judgment, not an absolute judgment, but you're making some judgment uh, and, and looking at it. And really that comes with experience. Uh, and that goes over to Lane's uh, uh, comment is, uh, you know, we were talking earlier about slowing down on your approach to the scene. And Lane points out that that's really a telltale sign on the, the experience of the crew. Uh, when you see them roaring into the scene and uh, sirens blaring, uh, the the crew is 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 
accelerated or excited a little bit. And, and I know from, from life experience, I haven't made some really great decisions. I haven't made any brilliant decisions when I'm in a high, excitable state. You don't, you don't tend to make good decisions. Uh, let me switch back to Joe. You got one more slide up there, Joe. Let me uh, go ahead. Where are you going with this? Well, this is actually a chair on fire in the in the room, and it's it's not used up the air, and you see the smoke is not banked to the floor, so this hasn't gone extreme. That's the window. It's all it's open only about ten or twelve inches. The window's still intact. Flames haven't broken the window. When we're in that growth fire incipient growth phase of it, the indications we get from the smoke are different from once the fire decays. And then once the fire reaches a high velocity growth, so the indications or the symptoms of that fire are two different things. Now this is the same chair where the fire is decaying and it's gradually one, two, three. It actually s chokes the fire down from the around it down to the base of the chair to eventually the, the shot on the right is what you actually see with the camera. So the 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 principle to learn from this is simply that it will change. Uh, it will change depending on the phase that the fire's in, and the symptoms tell you different things. If I made any sense. No, you did. You did. Uh, I, I think you know we're going to have to get you, uh, Joe. We're going to have to get you to do a, a whole night on this. Uh, just just going into that. But you know, two things that you're pointing out, which are which kind of is the the framework where we started tonight your experience in study you know you've become an expert in this area just like everybody's got their own you know and there are different in our fire service field you know you got dave dotson reading smoke and and chris is doing buildings and you know there's there's a piece of everybody there's the hazmat gurus and 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 everybody out there and I, my message for doing this this hangout tonight was to tell the young folks that listen and the, even the senior folks that listen get into a discussion there's three things that come into your decision making on the fire ground mm -hmm. It is your training, and it is your personal experience. And, and I'll go back to something Joe said two or three weeks ago, and that was, you know, it, it, Chief, you're in, the, you're in the San Diego Fire Department, and you do not have four equal shifts. You do not have every engine company the same because you have different people. You have senior people. You have people with more experience, less experience. Uh, it, it's interesting. I did a whole look one time at – at major fatal fires or loss of life to firefighters, when we look at Bryceland Street, you look at a number of uh, uh, fires, people were operating on a different shift. And you almost, I, I always wondered to myself, I never knew the answer to this, but you always wondered to yourself, did that shift operate differently that night because so many people were out of position or does something not click exactly right? So sharing these tips and tricks of our business, I thought was going to be a good way to just get generate a discussion, and that's all we're trying to do with these Sunday night hangouts is is try to generate a discussion. Uh, Joe, you got a couple of other slides up there, but the hour is gaining late on us. I wanted to talk about just a couple of personnel sort of things uh, before we did that, so I, I don't mean to cut that discussion off, but. Uh, uh, let's let's talk about within the firehouse. You have any tips or tricks within the firehouse? Let's assume we were talking to a to a young firefighter that came on shift, whether it's an Adams Rural Department or a chief, whether it's you on the on the city job. Uh, what, what's a tip or a trick we could tell a, a newbie? Uh, here, I just you know tell the newer guys, listen to the senior guy that's been here for. A long time. You, you're gonna learn something from them. Um, even some of the ones that's been there for a short period of time, the stuff they've seen on the fire ground. You know, just listening and communicating with your with your young firefighters. You know, they can pick up on a lot of stuff. Yeah, it, I I think that's valuable. I uh, I I always told our folks uh, when we started and had new hires, we would actually bring back a couple of retired folks to have the two retired folks speak to the crew that was just coming on the job so that they would get an understanding of where this department has been or, or what, it's, what it's like. And it, it kind of, you know, the new person has to learn as much about the job 
but also learn about the history of that department and, and where it's been and what it's going to. John, your thoughts? Uh, take off your damn necktie before you try and start the chainsaw in the morning. <laughs> Uh, I've, seen that. I've seen that more than once because uh, by tradition our uh, probies wear uh, neckties till somebody tells them to take it off and but by God they're supposed to check their equipment out in the morning and nobody's told them to take off their tie yet so <laughs> they'll be out there trying to start this off. Yeah. Um, I, I agree a lot with the tradition thing. Um, we do uh, what we call a family night uh, at the academy and uh, Somebody from the uh, museum board always goes down to talk to them about that um, and some of the traditions and that kind of thing. And, and quite a few uh, folks have uh, been volunteers at the museum and then have uh, moved over to, uh, to becoming you know, uh, actual firefighters. So that's a good thing. Um, all kinds of little tips and, and tricks for probies. Uh, most of them are, are uh, probably on the on the pet peeve side for me of things that we make them do or that they've decided that they ought to do and, and have become tradition and maybe aren't the smartest thing. But that's a whole nother show probably. Yeah, well, you know what? The fire service, sometimes we do things and we never actually figure out why we do them. <laughs> but, we, but we're good at it. You know, we're consistent at it. So uh, I think we'll call it right there. Uh, again, the hour flew by. Uh, we had a small panel and uh, we just kind of just a shotgun approach tonight. We were not as formal as we normally are. But I certainly uh, thank everybody for uh, for being here. Lane, thanks for jumping in at the last minute. Even no no camera, no mic. We uh, we got your input in here and got you part of the puzzle. Uh, so, anything else before we wrap up? Uh, just a, my my standard comment to everybody. We will be here next week at eight o'clock Eastern Sunday night. Uh, we look forward to everybody uh, joining and watching us, and uh, we're picking up views. Uh, some folks are going to the YouTube page. Again, just a reminder, we have created firefightingtoday.com, firefightingtoday.com, and we actually have all of our previous videos are up there. Uh, tonight's video is already on the front page up there, uh, so you can check that out and watch the shows, or you can go right to YouTube and, uh, and watch them there, or certainly on Google+. Uh, any last thoughts before we go? Yeah, Pete, I do got one. Um, sure. Learn from your mistakes, you know? If there's something you made a mistake on, come back, talk about it at the firehouse, around the table, whatever it may be. If there's something we need to train on and train better and tear it apart and take a look at it, then that's what we need to do. But uh, learn from your mistakes. Yeah, I, I think that's a critical one, uh, Adam, and I'm embarrassed. You know, I've been around a long time, and I think Joe has and, and, and John. Um, it kills me when we have a fatal fire. And we come back and we say we wouldn't do anything different. Uh, we, we do need to learn from our mistakes sometimes. And uh, they're not all mistakes, but we do need to learn. Uh, and that's a, great, that's a great point. Sure, I'll throw out a quick wrap-up. Go. Socks. you got to have good socks, invest in good socks. Whether you're in Wildland or whether you're uh, in New England in the uh, winter, buy some good socks. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I uh, I I was assigned uh, I was assigned a safety officer one night. Uh, mutual aid fire. It was about a hundred fifty thousand square foot building, and I did not have socks in my boots uh, that night. So the next day was a very very ugly day. Uh, as I was walking around with uh, massive blisters, you know, I did ask for a Segway, but they didn't give me a Segway to drive around the building. I was kind of mad about that a little golf cart or something I wanted, but I never got it. Good socks. I like it. I like it. All right. Uh, let's call it at that. And uh, we will see you all next week. And uh, members of the panel, uh, you can you can hang around a minute as we uh, as we disconnect. Good night, all.